It's a gift. It's, there's, there's not enough of it. Anything else about, yes, Robin, and then I'll go to Libby. Thank you, Robin. So Robin saying that it's it's a relief because she's not having to strain to hear, and that as a collective is something beautiful for us to remember that if we can just be quiet together, sometimes we're not. Maybe our nervous systems can relax, have a chance to relax. Thank you. Yes, Libby. Yes. Yes. Yes, so Libby is saying that collective silence can be deadly. Collective silence can be louder than anything people say. And again, especially in the church, and it really is contextual and around social position and how silence feels and what it holds can be very fraught. Thank you. Yes, Marta. Yes, white silence brings violence against black people. Yes, yes. And so it's hard to trust it is what you're saying. It's hard to trust silence. And maybe it's especially hard to trust silence in largely white spaces. You know. Anybody else about our collective relationship? I'm sorry. Oh, up front. Oh, yes. Come on. So Lindsay's saying it can be the path of least resistance. We hide behind it. We don't want the work. We don't want the conflict. So we'll just be quiet. Yes. Thank you. And Margie. And you would say the silence is the work. So getting quiet enough after we've heard all the voices to, to let the mystery be. To let things sink in. <laughs> yeah, what emerges out of it can be really powerful. Yes. Did I see you? Yes. Shutting down. Shutting down, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Shutting down, blocking out, turning off. Overwhelm, it's like a sensory shutdown or a, a way that we become immobilized. A collective, a collective numbing. Thank you. So you see the, the complication, right? It's, this is the, the beauty of our collective, is that we bring all these different ways that silence holds meaning, promise, peril, and we, and we also lift up what we need from each other in order to build trust in the places where we don't know and where there is mystery and where there is unknown. 
And the good news is we trust God to consecrate it all. And Amy Kim, you're going to assure us of that, correct? I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping. And Arthur's going to come help me with that. So one thing I noticed in the silence is sometimes it leaves room for other voices to be heard. And of course, I love all the sounds of the children. Because that reminds us that there's more and more life to be had. Amen? Amen. So Arthur, I'm just going to invite you to pour this in. Get it all in there. And it doesn't matter if it splashes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So you can put that down and then we can splash around in it. That's like the best part of the whole thing. So... This is the thing. You just put your hands in there if you want to. Is that water reminds us that God is as close as the water that runs through our bodies. That the love that we have in God is so abundant. Even in deserts. You want to splash anybody? No, okay. That's all right. right. You're new. You'll get there. I see these people back here. They need some too. Yeah. Oh, we really got Marsha. I really got Marsha. So sorry. Yeah. But you know, the thing about love is that it surprises us because it can be so overwhelming. So friends, I want to remind you that this love that we have and the forgiveness we have and the abundant grace is all ours. It always has been. So friends, I now invite us in light of this abundant love for us to share Christ's peace with one another The peace of Christ be with you all, and those online, your sound is back up. We're so glad to have you here. And the peace of Christ be with Kyle, who has been troubleshooting. Let us greet one another with signs of Christ's peace. Thanks, buddy. Peace be with you. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. I'm Marsha Mount Shoup. I'm one of the pastors here. And I welcome you. I'm glad to have you here. I I use she, her pronouns. And we're very glad that you're here for this special happy day. 
where our worship service includes the installation of our new associate pastor, Lou Parkema. And I'm going to take a second because, because this is an official act of the Presbytery of Western North Carolina. We have some special guests, and I want you to make sure to welcome them warmly and, and show our joy that for their support of the ministries here at Grace Covenant. So I'm going to introduce our installation commission briefly. First, Ken Murkison. We're so glad he's here. He's um, the vice moderator. He's the vice moderator of the Presbytery of Western North Carolina, and also, I believe, a ruling elder at Warren Wilson, Presbyterian. And are you the clerk of session there? Not anymore. Not anymore. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> congratulations, right? <laughs> so, and Ken is acting as the moderator today of this installation service. Also, uh, Reverend Scott Freeman. So... Uh, Scott is an associate presbyter, and she's here representing the presbytery staff. Also, um, ruling elder M.C. Ellis. <laughs> who we know and love as one of our ruling elders here at Grace Covenant. Reverend Carol Hovis. <laughs> who we also know and love. Reverend David Kozad. Virginia Herbert, who is a ruling elder at New Hope Presbyterian. And Sarah Thornburg, who is a ruling elder at First Presbyterian. And I am also proud and grateful to be on the commission today as the preacher of the sermon. So thank you. So we welcome you, we're glad you're here, and we hope that you'll welcome and, and connect with each other as well. There are four ways to connect when we're together. You can say hello in the YouTube chat. You can email us at connect at gcpcusa.org. You can use the connect pads that are throughout the sanctuary. We hope you'll find one, fill one out, and pass it around. And you can also sign one of the visitor cards if you're new or newish to our community. This congregation is centered on the work of dismantling white supremacy and divorcing ourselves from the way white supremacy shows up in our bodies, in our relationships, in our community, and in the church. This is the work of this church, and we believe it's the work of the church with a capital C. So we're glad that you're here to join us in that work. And an extension of that work, an expression of that work, is that when we gather, we acknowledge the land that we are on. So let's join together in our community land acknowledgement. We acknowledge our complicated history on this land called Togiatsi by the fire people, the Cherokee ancestors. And we are working to deepen our understanding of the harmful history of Christianity and the ways Christians have stolen land from non-Christians all over the world. We acknowledge the sacredness in these ancient mountains and in the mystery and majesty of all the wildlife and trees and plants that thrive here. We are thankful for signs of resilience and resolve in the way this land now grows food and community. Together we practice following spirit on unknown paths, letting go and leaning in. We believe that we can change and that the world can change too. Thank you. I invite the ushers to come on in and take up the offering. We appreciate any ways that you can support all the ministries of this church with your generosity, with your financial resources. There are many opportunities to engage, and we hope you'll subscribe to our weekly news so you can learn more about those opportunities. Today, our formation classes resume immediately after worship. The adult ed class that also includes youth is 
going to be focusing on white Christian nationalism and the danger that it poses to our democracy. That will begin downstairs at, um, in the fellowship hall after worship. The um, middle school youth can meet in the um, youth room. There will also be music with Ray with um, our younger kids, and we hope you'll join us for that. Youth group and music for youth also resumes tonight at 5 o'clock. And tonight at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, we're very grateful to welcome Chris Highland here to give a community lecture on white Christian nationalism and the danger that it poses to our democracy. So we hope you'll join us for that. It's both here in the sanctuary and on YouTube. We're very grateful for the work of our Deacon of the Week, Paul Tierney. Where are you, Paul? There he is. He's got on the beautiful purple sash. He's available for questions, for prayer concerns. You can email him this week or give him a call. His information is in Realm, it's also in the bulletin, and it will be in the weekly news. Thank you, Paul, for all you do. The beautiful flowers today are given in honor of Luke's installation by the GCPC staff. And Luke is going to take those home and enjoy them because we want him to enjoy them and, have, and remember this happy day for as long as he can. It's time for your GCPC at home pictures. Remember, this is a way we build community when we're together, no matter if you're home or in the sanctuary. Snap a picture of yourself worshiping and email it to us at prayer at gcpcusa.org. Take them early and often and send them our way so we can share them at the end of the service. I do have a few prayer concerns for you to hold in prayer this week. First, we lift up a joy that Bill McNeff had successful cataract surgery this week. Yay! We also are so happy to see Trina here who was struggling with pneumonia this week. So we're so glad to see you up and feeling better. And please pray for Larry Stern who's going to have surgery on the 18th as a part of his cancer treatment. Larry, we're with you. We're we're praying, we're going to pull you through, and we're so excited that you're coming to this time, this end of this treatment. Also, we want to lift up two um, families in our congregation who are especially experiencing loss. Brent Thompson's dad, Clay, died Friday night. We've been praying for him. He had a stroke and also has suffered from Alzheimer's. So please pray for their whole family as they grieve and they prepare to celebrate his life next weekend in Kansas. Also, we pray for Margie Groves and her family. Margie lost her sister-in-law, Connie, who we've been praying for. Connie passed away on Friday as well with her daughter by her side. And Margie, we're praying for you during this time. You might have other prayer concerns you'd like for us to lift up. Thank you, right Bonnie. <laughs> that was as if on cue. Thank you, Bonnie. If you have other prayer concerns, yes. Thank you, the Jones family who, and his name was? Isaiah Adams, who was a part of YTL and just passed away at age 14. He passed away at 13. 13. He would have been 14 of cancer. Thank you. We pray for his whole family. Thank you so much, Libby. If you have other prayer concerns, be sure to put a, a look at y'all. So just put them in the chat on YouTube. You can email them at, to us at prayer at gcpcusa.org. If you have another prayer card that you do and you didn't make it into the offering plate, you can come and set it on the communion table at any time during the service. I want to invite the children to come up now for some faith sharing, and we're glad you're here.
everyone. Hey, I'm so excited to be here with y'all. I, I, I'm so excited because I've got uh, a song and the words. I want to read you the words of the song. You, you guys know who Mr. Rogers is? Yeah. yeah. He's a really nice guy that used to be on the TV. And he would sing songs. And I really like the words of this song. If you, I like. Not the things you wear. Not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. The way you are right now. The way deep down inside you. Not the things that hide you. Not your toys. They're just beside you. But it's you I like. Every part of you. Your skin, your eyes, your feelings whether they're old or new. I hope that you'll remember, even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like. It's you. Hmm. Man, you might have seen me. I was getting a little emotional just reading those words. And it re because that reminds me of all the people in my life that like me. You know, when you're an adult, Sometimes you find people that don't like you, and that's a scary thing. At m my old church, there were people that didn't like my hair, didn't like the things that I would wear. They really didn't like the way I did my job. <laughs> and it really seemed like they were hoping that I would be somebody else. And if I could tell you something, sometimes I pretended to be somebody else. Because I was hoping that would get them to like me. But it didn't work. I, I ended up leaving that job and having to find somewhere new. And that was so scary. But when I met the people that were looking for someone that would fill the job that I have now, it was so cool to see that they were looking for someone that was kind of like me. And they wanted me to be myself. And Kyle, if you could put that picture up on the screen. I don't know if you can see that picture, but when I saw this, this really meant something to me. It says, the sooner you be you, the sooner the people looking for you will find you. And that feels like what today is about for me. Because today is a special day where me and this church are going to make some, say some special words to each other. We're going to say, I like you. <laughs> Just the way you are. And we're going to promise to take care of each other. And we're going to recognize that there's going to be a lot about our life together where we will learn and work and grow and make mistakes and pick ourselves up from those mistakes. And in the process of all of that, we think, that you are going to grow into someone that's really cool. I want to be around to see that happen. And the, the church is seeming to say to me that. They want to be around to see that happen to me. So I want you all to remember to be yourselves because there's people out there looking for someone just like you. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for making me, making me just the way I am. And thank you for the person that I will grow into. Be with me today, be with me today. And, every day after. and every day after. And help me find, help me find the people looking for me. Amen. Thanks, y'all. We're all set.
Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and be what be with us in ways that we can receive and absorb. Open our hearts, our bodies, and our ways of thinking and hearing to the wisdom of your presence and your word. Clear anything that might stand in the way of our hearing and heeding your call in our lives. Amen. Amen. A reading from 1 Kings chapter 9. Let's listen for God's word for the church today. God said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Yehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel Mahala, as prophet in your place. So Elijah set out from there and found Elisha, son of Shabbat, who was plowing. There were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him. And he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by Elisha and threw his mantle over him. Elisha left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Go back again, for what have I done to you? Elisha returned from following. Elijah took the yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Let me continue to listen again for God's word for the church today. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet God feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will God not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? Your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. 
but seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. The word of the Lord. So of all the call stories we could evoke today, Luke has invited us to consider the prophet Elisha's. Now, I've, I've preached on this bizarre passage in 1 Kings before, but I've never done it at the installation service of a new colleague in ministry who will be serving in the church I, too, am called to serve. So I want to get one thing straight before we get too far down the road in our work today exploring the passage in 1 Kings and the passage in Matthew from Jesus' great sermon. This is for all those who believe we should not talk about politics in church. You're going to want to see Luke after the service to thank him for this growth opportunity for you. Today we're going to be talking about politics. Don't worry. We won't really have time to get into the hellscape of our current presidential election. That's tonight with Chris Hyland. Uh, he'll be calling us all to pay attention to the sobering, dangerous precipice that we are on with our democracy as white Christian nationalism gains steam. So if you came here today hoping for a sweet little celebration of a tender little way that God calls us to serve, you can skip talking to Luke after the service and just go straight to prayer. Just go straight to prayer. <laughs> Call is not often a feel-good story, but more a harrowing tale tangled up with our limited vision of both God and ourselves. The story of Elisha's call is tangled up with both overestimations and underestimations of both God and the prophet. After all, Elisha's just a humble little farmer minding his own business plowing the fields, right? Actually, no. Think more sophisticated, high wealth agricultural operation than a small family farm. For Elisha to be driving 12 oxen means this was no small farm, but the ancient version of a lucrative business. Elisha was wealthy and probably an important source of food production for the whole community, not just for his family. In other words, we must get out on the table right away that Elisha had better options for his life's work than risking life and limb to be a prophet in the contentious times that he lived in. Elisha had a lot to lose. That's one of the first things we need to remember about call. God provides. But the provisions are not always what we've learned to see as lucrative and secure. Call is not about comfort. It's about trust. And often that trust is tested over and over and over. I'm going to throw another one in. And over again. <laughs> as call is forged and finds its way in the world. So Elisha not only leaves his lucrative, lucrative business, but he pretty much burns it down on his way out the door. He destroys the capital that he has by slaughtering his 12 oxen, and he feeds the people one last time and then follows Elijah into the rough and tumble world of being a prophet in ninth century Israel. Now, if you're rusty on your knowledge of what was going on in ninth century Israel, 
think of it like a cringe-worthy reality TV show about royal families or celebrities, you know, cutthroat palace intrigue. That's what we're looking at. So the tribal structure of society was unraveling and giving way to a more and more concentrated monarchy. Local politics were getting engulfed in a larger and larger world stage. Higher and higher stakes alliances were being forged. And a lot of these High-stakes alliances were being forged because of the strong, surging military threat from the Philistines. This was an intensifying concern and pushed the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel, Israel and Judah, to begin looking for friends to increase the strength of their military. Now, the monarchy in Israel was built more for military protection against this Philistine military machine than it was really for any religious or spiritual reason. But the prophetic story that spins itself through the emergence of ancient Israel onto a bigger and bigger global stage is foregrounded in the biblical story that we have. But these scriptural accounts are not meant to be chronological history. They are salvation history. In other words, they are religious propaganda. Stories told with a particular lens, with a particular agenda to make it seem as if all the political maneuvering and military positioning of these burgeoning global powers was something that God was dictating. Now, we can't really understand Elisha's story without understanding Elijah. These verses, before we get to Elisha's wrenching leave-taking of his lucrative family business, well, we see Elijah bereft in the desert. He feels like he's done everything God asked him to do, And now the queen of the Omri monarchy, that's Jezebel, wants him dead. Elijah flees to the desert and is told by God to wait for the Lord to pass by. Then wind splits over in the mountain, and then there's an earthquake and there's a fire. Again, not things to really settle your nervous system, right? And God is not in any of those terrifying, wrenching displays of nature's power, but then God comes in the what? The silence. The sheer silence. This term in Hebrew for silence suggests that silence brings with it its own visceral experience. It's sort of what Lynn said about our silence. There's an energy to it. The deafening quiet after the storm, the the embers of destruction and despair and trauma, the kind of quiet that's hard to sit in. Not a sweet breeze, but an eerie still that feels dangerous. Now God speaks to Elijah not with the tenderness of a concerned parent, but more like the sharpness of a hard-driving NFL coach. I happen to know one of those, but... (laughs) Or a military general. What are you doing here, Elijah? And then after Elijah tells God his life is in danger, what does God say? Go back. Get back in there and keep fighting. Oh, and on your way, stop by and get this new assistant who's going to be able to finish the job. So Elijah was in the fix he was in because he was a zealot. He was zealous for the one God movement. This was a burgeoning movement of the time. And we don't really know how popular it was because a lot of the way it's told in this story was probably gone back and put in by a post-exilic editor. 
But Elijah was challenging King Ahab's palace because Ahab was allowing the worship of Baal along with the worship of Yahweh. After, and, and the worship of Baal was something that Ahab refused to stop because it was political. That was a political decision. You see, his Phoenician queen, Jezebel, brought with her these practices of worship from her culture. And so Ahab was all about building alliances. That's part of why they got married in the first place. And this increased his social capital, his influence of the empire that his father Omri had built. But Elijah was unrelenting. And he led the one Yahweh enthusiast into an armed battle with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. So Elijah got himself into a little trouble. When Queen Jezebel heard that the prophets of her native religion had been slaughtered at Mount Carmel, she was understandably upset. And she sent word to Elijah that she would avenge their deaths with his death. Now, Elijah is this mysterious figure with so much unknown surrounding who he really was. But far from being slaughtered on a battlefield, legend has it that Elijah was translated into another dimension in a chariot of fire. And Elisha, his successor, witnessed it. Then Elijah takes on this supernatural place in both apocryphal writings and in some religious practices. There are varying beliefs about Elijah that emerged in the ancient world, but some included that he somehow had been able to see and know the suffering of people in some kind of hellish afterlife. And that he would come back someday and, and, and face the Antichrist, that he would usher in the Messiah's final judgment, and much more more than we can get into today. Suffice it to say, though, the lore about Elijah is all wrapped up in this ascending power of monotheism on the world stage. Worshiping, God only, worshiping multiple gods only became a political problem and a reason for murderous remedies as monotheism became a way to nation build. Where is God in all this? Honestly, it's really hard to say sometimes. There are many different gods portrayed in the biblical witness. Views of God vary wildly in Scripture from warlord to mother hen to shepherd to murderous and jealous to generous and merciful and compassionate. The Yahweh-only prophets like Elijah and Elisha held a belief that was probably a minority view at the time. But reading back into the salvation history, editors amplified these monotheistic themes. So much of how the monarchy emerged from the tribal system of judges was driven by military aspirations. It was all about politics. It was all about power. Not so much about doctrine. So religion, in so many different ways, in so many different cultures, it becomes a cover for political maneuvers. A way to signal allegiance in different directions. But Ahab probably didn't have a problem with worshiping Yahweh and worshiping Ball. He was fine with it because it was a good political move. And Jezebel probably didn't have a theological problem with Yahweh. She just had a political problem with Elijah. The monotheistic faith traditions do. They, we, we have a complicated history. Anytime a religion emerges from a local, indigenous, culturally located practice onto a global stage, its ultimate claims begin to be foregrounded more and more. 
And the power of those claims often spreads more robustly when they become, when they become politically expedient for those with formal power, for those with military might. You see, no religion is without its shadows. Hebrew scripture and the New Testament hear that over and over and over again. The Elijah and Elisha accounts of 1st and 2nd Kings are iconic examples of why we can never get too comfortable with locating ourselves or our religious identity on the moral high ground all the time. So as the monarchy became more concentrated, more and more people became disenfranchised. There was an increase in injustice, in oppression, in suffering, and in social stratification. Those who told and handed down and eventually wrote down the stories of Elijah and Elisha had a particular view of how prophets participated in this life. And these stories were probably told and handed down and written by their particular prophetic guilds. Remember, First and Second Kings is not history. It's salvation history. It's to encourage a certain view of history from the perspective of this monotheistic lineage. Elijah and Elisha are cast as similar to Moses and Joshua. And these prophets, they take on mythic qualities in the stories that their guilds tell about them. They were miracle workers. They could cause suffering or well-being. They were powerful intercessors. They confronted kings about injustice and religious infidelity. They are those who speak an authoritative word. They are those who are obedient to God. They are the ones who tell humans why we need to be obedient to God. And they tell them about promises that God makes and keeps for the faithful. Now, in all this, there are powerful stories of prophets fighting for the people who were more and more oppressed as the monarchy becomes more and more powerful. The prophets healed people. They even resurrected some people from the dead. They provided material support for people who were suffering from salmon and drought. And, as we've already heard, Elijah also slaughtered the prophets of Baal and then got scared and fled when his life was threatened because of his actions. Elisha cursed children who made fun of him and which led to their deaths. He prompted a coup to overthrow Ahab because he wasn't just worshiping one God. Elisha helped to enthrone King Jehu by killing people, including encouraging him to kill Queen Jezebel. Post-exile authors would try to turn Queen Jezebel into a seductress and associate her religious practice with sexual immorality. But Jezebel was a powerful woman with political savvy. And we do not have the benefit of her supporters getting to write her story for our sacred texts. So then after all that, all that Elisha did to get Ahab dethroned and secure Jehu's coup to defend the One God movement, what do you think Jehu ended up doing? He cozied up with the Assyrians and started worshiping their gods. So if we're going to talk about call via monotheistic traditions, then we have to look at all the ways call can become confused and concealed and how tenuous our religious impulses are when they become tangled up with political power. It seems more faithful to be honest that God's call isn't really about power and influence at all. That seems more true to, true to form for the creator of the universe who would not have such a limited vision 
to believe that palace intrigue or military might will be human, humanity's path to mutual liberation. Jesus' instruction to any who would listen in his great sermon is that call is about trusting a God we're only beginning to get to know and we'll never fully know. God tells us the truth not in military might, but in the lilies of the field, in the barn swallows who can build their nests in the most unlikely nooks and crannies of things. The provisions of call are etched within our created nature, in the flame of divine love that's in each one of us. Jesus is also drawing from the wisdom traditions of his Jewish heritage that we are made for each other and for right relationship. All of these things are a part of our religious heritage. And God's calling card will always bear the imprint of that call to restoration of right relationship with each other, with all things, and with God. Jesus invites the crowd to look around and see how God provides, how things fit together, how they unfold. And Jesus invited people to do this in an age of anxiety and fear. Faith is really about changing our relationship to all the bad things that can happen in life. Instead of using our energy to worry about scarcity and death and scanning the horizon for enemies, we're called to use our energy to believe in abundance and in the mysteries of eternity and in our deep connection to everything that is. Again, all these things are in our religious heritage, the violence and the wisdom of our interdependence and the call to social righteousness. Now, it is true that as humans, we're, we're built to protect ourselves. We're built to survive. So the impulse to fight is one of the options that our biology hardwires within us. The fighting parts of us aren't bad or wrong. They're just parts that need more support more room to build trustworthy connections so that they don't have to be pushed into such extreme roles and behaviors. Because you see, our faith does not have to be about drawing lines or dying on mountains of principle and doctrine. Our faith can get back to the most life-giving and sustaining roots of it, those deeply held truths about our shared humanity and the balance that our human family really needs to thrive. The prophets of old were fighting for the people in one way, shape, or form. And they weren't afraid to speak truth to power. They took on different personas and mythologies when portrayed through the filter of conquest and empire. But at their core, these ancestors were trying to faithfully find their way in a confusing and dangerous world. And they had their limits, and they had their frailties, just like we do. It seems like all the prophets, including Jesus, were asking people to learn how to be trustworthy. Learn how to keep promises that you make. And in our time, I can't really imagine a way to build trust and keep promises that condones harm or condones violence or that gets caught up in the fervor of scarcity and nationalism. And so we find ourselves here in this moment in time, marking another call that God has made in our human family the call for Luke to be the associate pastor here at Grace Covenant.
Now, pastors in the, the Presbyterian Church USA, this is where I'm just going to break some news to you. <laughs> We're not kingmakers these days. Yeah. And our influence in the halls of Congress is far outgunned by the big money of commerce and industry and military. And yet we're still called to the work of peddling in social righteousness. And that is loaded. And that is fraud. We're not called to stay out of politics, Luke. We're called into the fray. Not because of the fear of scarcity, but because of the trust in God's abundant love. Scarcity is the result of injustice and greed. It is not the inescapable nature of humans. And the prophetic voice of our ancestors at, it be at its best propels us to never let go of the faith in God's abundant love. God's call is to all and for all. God's call is through all through our communities and our deep connections. So Luke, today we're celebrating your call through the protocols and practices of an institution we lovingly call the Presbyterian Church USA. This is our way of saying that today is not just about you. It's about us. And it's about God. And this is our way of saying we share life in common and that you are not alone. Even as we take heart in the institutional connections that authorize and bless your call to this church, Luke, I pray that you can remember that your call is not to an institution or deemed worthy because of doctrines and dogma. Your call is from God to community. The institution involved here to mark this moment and make it official is not our God. The institutions made up a lot of people just like us who are human with holy imaginations and lots of questions. We're all people with energy and with limitations. Call is collective and it can feel lonely. Call is promising and it's also risky. Call is mysterious and very, very concrete. It makes you move places. It changes your orientation to life. It convinces you to put your life in the hand of a bunch of strangers and trust that God will provide. You and I and so many of us here, we know the anguish of call and how much the church itself can make us question the very concept of call. And you and I and so many of us here, we know that your whole self is called on. Your all is invited to take up space in this call. Luke, you are here because God is God and you are you. And this is where you belong. In God's holy imagination and the mysterious unfolding of things. I, I trust that while the, world word, the road will not be easy, it will be healing. Not just for you, but for us. So thank you, Luke, for your yes to this call. And thanks be to God for this call to us all to commit to the work of faithfully finding our way together in a promising and perilous world. Thanks be to God. You made me work for it. <laughs>
know God is able to deliver in times of need. I know that he'll keep you safe from all earthly harm. One day when my weary soul Be forever blessed. Trust and never doubt. Jesus will surely bring you home. He that fail the end. Joy will sing of God's mercy. Every day, every hour, in his behalf. I will sing and give thanks to thee. King Pharaoh, and didn't he cool the fiery furnace for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And I think of what my God can do. He delivered Daniel, I know he will deliver you. Trust.
please join us in the litany of gifts and call. A body has many parts, and each part has its own gift and purpose. So all of us together with Christ are one body, and we belong to each other. We have different gifts according to the grace God has given us. If your gift is to, if your gift is to share God's word, mm -hmm. speak, speak it out with faith, faith and hope. If your gift is service, Serve, serve with compassion and courage. If your gift is the heart of a teacher, teach, teach with love and honesty. honesty. Let preachers preach with conviction and givers give freely. And let those who serve those who live in poverty serve joyfully. Let us all embody Serving the Lord with rejoicing in hope, enduring trials with patience, praying without ceasing, supporting one another, and welcoming all. Today we reclaim our historic calling and remember the great ends of the church. The proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship to the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. In his baptism, Luke was clothed with Christ. He was later ordained of the Grand Rapids North Classics of the Reformed Church of America and is now called by God to the voice of the church to serve as associate pastor of this congregation. We remember with joy our common calling to serve Christ and we celebrate God's call to our brother to serve among us as associate pastor at Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. Luke, will you please face the congregation and answer the following questions that the Book of Order addresses to those who are about to be installed as a minister of word and sacrament. Luke, you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior. Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? I do. do. You? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what, church, of what scripture leads us to believe and do. And will you be instructed and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? I do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? I will. Will you be governed by our church polity? Will you abide by its discipline? And will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? I do. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? I will. Will you be a faithful teaching elder, proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, 
teaching faith and caring for people? Will you be active in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice and joy and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? I will. Now we direct the constitutional questions to the congregation. Do you, the members of the church, accept Lou Carcamer as your associate pastor chosen by God through the voice of the congregation to guide you in the ways of Jesus Christ? Do you? Do you agree to pray for him, encourage him, to, respond, to respect his decisions, and to follow as he guides you Serving Jesus Christ alone, who, who alone is head of the church, do you? Yes. Do you promise to pay him fairly and provide for his welfare as he works among you, to stand by him in trouble and share his joys? Do you promise to listen to the word he preaches, welcome his pastoral care, and honor his authority as he seeks to honor and obey Jesus Christ, our Lord, do you? Luke, it'd be great for you to join me if that's okay. It's, we want to pray for you. I know I was slightly cautioned about a laying on of hands, but I do just want to um, say that we, on this day of celebration and joy, want to give uh, thanks for Luke. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you this day and we offer our thanks for Luke Harkema, for your uh, wondrous way of working and coming to a full knowledge of him even before he was born, for the ways that you have claimed him and made him a child of God, for the ways that you have gifted him with love and with joy. We give you thanks also for the ways that you have called him to serve in communities that are communities of family and friends and neighbors, and in particular, in the community that we call church. We ask this day boldly that you will pour out your Holy Spirit on him, that you will give him your love, your grace, your joy, and your wisdom. We come before you this day and give you thanks that Luke has said yes to this call and that before him he has the opportunity to offer his gifts in seeking and living out justly, to offer his leadership in worship, in song, in teaching, and in the common life of this community. We ask this day that you will continue to bless him, that you will bless him as he continues to faithfully seek your way in the world and to seek to love and serve you. We offer this prayer in the name of Christ who taught us to pray with one voice and this day we will be praying together using the words printed in the insert in your bulletin. Let us join our voices together now. Our mothering, guiding, moral force, gracious and loving creator, who is our strength and shield and promises never to leave or forsake us, who enfolds us and is all around us in heaven and earth, blessed and cherished, divine and wondrous, and powerful are you. May your purpose and everlasting presence your dream and vision of a world of peace come to be, and may your hope for us be realized on earth as it is in heaven. Give each one of us enough to sustain all of us. In our imperfections, we ask for forgiveness for ourselves from the bondage of selfishness, from the distractions of prideful pursuits. 
Help us to find the best of our human selves and to love that which others reject. For all that you have created, the beauty and grace and the glory is yours forever. Amen. So be it. In the English dictionary, the word charge has multiple meanings. It's also found myriad times in scripture. Charge, the word charge, can be a verb as well as a noun. To demand a price, to charge a price, to accuse someone or something, to charge someone or something, to store electrical energy, <laughs> to rush forward in attack, or to entrust someone with a task or duty. In our Reformed tradition, we use the word charge to mean entrusting someone with a duty. And Luke, I'm confident, I'm really confident in your commitment and your abilities with the duties that this congregation has entrusted you. So let's all take a breath, <laughs> take a deep breath. It's already, you've already got it, Luke, you've already got it. So this morning, I want to play just a bit with the derivation of this word, charge. So if you were to look it up in the dictionary, which is what I love to do with words, you'll find that the word comes from Latin and Old French and Old <clears throat> English. And the word means a wheeled wagon cart, a charge, a wheeled wagon cart carrying a load. So really <laughs> imagine that, a wheeled wagon cart carrying a load. There is no way around it. <clears throat> Luke and all of us in this space who have been charged, and particularly, I want to talk about ministry. Ministry is a load. There is a burden and a sacrifice that we make when we say yes to this profession, to this vocation, especially when we're in our 20s. And I actually really mean that. Because this is not a nine to five job. They are long hours. There's a lot of night meetings. And this one is the one that really was hard for me in my 20s, is working on the weekends, <laughs> especially Saturday nights. It, there's, a, there's a sacrifice, and I, we don't talk about that enough sometimes in our, in our culture. 
And let me also say, it's really hard sometimes to grocery shop incognito. <laughs> you just, you're just so excited to walk down those aisles quietly on your own, and then you run into people from your congregation. It is a load. And Luke, as you say yes to this particular wagon cart load, notice when you are demanding too much of yourself. Come back to breath. Come back to breath. Observe when exhaustion and fatigue make you want to accuse the world of unfairness. Come back to breath. I'm just doing a twist on charge. When you're demanding too much of yourself, when, when we want to accuse the world of unfairness, be aware when the desire to help and the wanting to be liked creates a sensation of rushing forward. <clears throat> Come back to breath. Come back to breath. Of all the uh, dictionary definitions of charge that I shared a few moments ago, the one that I like best of all those is to store electrical energy. And interestingly enough, that seemed to be true in this space. That, that's the one that I like. And here's the deal. I believe, and I believe that many of us in this space, and Luke, you have joined us in this, that God, spirit, the sacred, is like an electrical energy in our bodies, in our relationships. I mean, even Lynn Meacham talked about it earlier, about the silence. There's electrical energy in our significant relationships. There's electrical energy in this community, in the sanctuary, and in all creation. So Luke, notice when your energy is low, when you need to be recharged. Observe your body. When someone makes a request of you, it's really okay to come back to breath before responding to the request. Sometimes we have a tendency, we minister types, to want to promise. It's okay to take a moment. Be curious if you need to reconnect with your being and not doing. And do you need to take a break, to take a walk? Do you need some water? And then this one in particular, do you need some time alone? Solitude, and this has been my experience, and I think you actually know this, Luke. Solitude is one of the best ways for all of us to recharge. So my hope for you, Luke, is that solitude is your constant companion. There is a way that we can embody solitude even when we're with other people. So I want all of you to take a moment Again, be, come back to breath. You might want to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to sense in your body that inner knowing, that inner sensation of grounding, of clarity, of inner strength. Let's take a breath or two with that place of inner knowing, inner grounding, inner clarity inner strength. That is the solitude that we take with us and is with us in all of our moments of our days. 
So Luke, solitude is not loneliness. It's that moment by moment knowing that within you, within ourselves, we find God resting. Solitude is claiming our inner worth, the divine spark within, the truth that our presence, our aliveness is enough. So I asked Luke to uh, recently to recall a time in your youth when you sensed the divine in your life. And this is what Luke wrote. So he, imagine you know, he was a teenager. Late at night, I snuck up into the sanctuary. He was with his youth group. Late at night, I snuck up into the sanctuary, climbed the chancel steps, and grabbed on to the pulpit with both hands. And this is what Luke wrote. I remember a bolt of energy going through my body. There was a hushed holiness in the thick darkness of that cavernous space. I lingered there for a while, looking over the empty pews. Take a breath. This is it, Luke. This is it. Yeah. This is the way spirit has been calling you your whole life. How, this is how, yeah. This is it. This is spirit charging you. Yeah. You know, some of you have heard me say this. Sometimes I believe in the U.S. Christian context we overstate this thing about you're not alone, you're not alone, you're not alone. We are alone. We are ultimately alone. It's just that we're connected. We're connected in our aloneness. Okay? So our ancestors knew that we need to recharge, which often means we need to be in the quiet, in the dark, in the empty places, calling us home. So I end again with your words, Luke. This is your charge, God's charge, that you have known a long time. There was a hushed holiness in the thick darkness of that cavernous space. I lingered there for a while looking over the empty pews. May it be so. A few minutes ago, Elder M.C. Ellis posed the constitutional questions from the Book of Order. And in answering those, you pledged to Luke words such as honor, follow, pay, that's an especially important one, Luke, <laughs> and pray. My charge to you this morning is to add to those one more word cherish cherish this unique child of god that the universe has somehow landed among us remember back the last fall when the associate pastor nominating committee was presenting his nomination to us and then through zoom he was patched in and appeared on the screen before us and i don't know about you but within 30 seconds i just said this is great. This is the perfect match for this church and where it is going. 
case, case in point, his message, faith sharing message with the children this morning. A second case in point, his joyful, goofy entering into the skits with Marsha and Amy Kim and Ray. Third case in point before the service out in the narthex this morning, Margie Groves complimented him on the wonderful stole that he was wearing. And Luke deadpan, I took this job in order to play dress up. <laughs> You don't need a newcomer, relative newcomer. You don't need a relative newcomer like me to tell you that this church is headed in a uniquely singular direction into God's uncertain future. And you have received an enormous gift toward it in this person. Cherish. Western North Carolina. I am going to present you with this stole that was um, made in Guatemala, which as m many of you know is the location for many of the sister churches in the Presbytery of Western North Carolina. And um, we hope that as your ministry at Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church um, continues and is joy-filled and energetic and um, charge that you will always remember your connection to the Presbytery and know that you have colleagues who are praying for you and who are there for mutual support and that you will uh, feel welcomed um, as you begin your formal uh, ministry in this place. And as I um, pass this, I just want to remind everyone that a, a stole is something that it's on some days sets us apart. It um, represents leadership. It also can be um, thought of almost as a yoke, uh, bearing a responsibility to share the word of God, whether that's in the words that we speak or the way we live our lives or the silence that we keep or we don't keep. Uh, but I also, when I think of the stole, think of the passage from John in John 13, when Jesus wrapped a towel around himself before he washed the feet of the disciples, that it is for me something tangible uh, that reminds me that I am clothed in this responsibility to serve uh, the people of God. And then it also, I think for many of us, reminds us of the prayer shawls that we have given and received. Um, and it is a reminder to me, something that is tangible and physical, uh, that we are called to the ministry of praying for God's people and that we uh, covet as leaders in the church the prayers of the community. So I hope for you it is a tangible reminder of all these many gifts that we received in this uh, unique and wonderful calling. Thank you. And Luke, we, we are so excited that you're here. We also have a gift uh, that is a symbol of, of the particular role that you are called to in our congregation. You are a minister of word and sacrament. And we have many amazingly talented people here, including one Keith Prince, who is an amazing potter. And he is creating a custom-made <laughs> communion set. This is the chalice, but it'll be a whole communion set for you um, to, again, mark that you are here to administer the sacraments, including our time around the Lord's table. And Keith can tell you more about this chalice, but these acorns, I believe the, the imprint of those comes from acorns from our actual property here at Grace Covenant. So it's, it's beautiful and it's special and we hope that it be something that you always cherish and remember how we see you among us. So, welcome. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? So he, he's going to make the whole set. And he just wanted you to see it.
sword and shield down by the riverside down by the riverside down by the riverside I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside study war no more I ain't gonna study war no more come on y'all study war no more talk to my prince of peace down by the riverside oh down i'm gonna talk to my prince of peace down by the riverside study God's beloved, prepare to receive a blessing that comes to you straight from God. And to me, those blessings often come when people reach out to me in love. And I know there's lots of different gestures people take to receive a blessing, but if today you could take it with your eyes open so that we could look at each other on this day, it means a lot to me and it means so much to this community. So, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. 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 You're invited to stick around for the postlude. Otherwise, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.